Good evening, everybody. I'm Carolyn Freund. I'm the Dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you to the inaugural public event of the Future of Democracy Initiative. And it's a huge privilege to have the Honorable Margaret McEwen as the keynote speaker today and also be joined by the Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons, um, both of whom will be up and coming. Um, sustaining democracy is, of course, a critical challenge of our time. And the work that our scholars are doing helps identify policies that work to support democracy, investigating such topics as the timing of elections, the effects of social media, what we can learn from diff different political systems around the world. And importantly, the initiative that Emily and Christine are leading goes beyond UC San Diego and brings together academics from the broader UC community, like the Institute of Global Conflict and Cooperation, where it's housed. So I'm just going to introduce Emily, and I understand Christine is going to speak later at the drinks. So Emily uh, Hafner Burton is appointed in both GPS and political science. She studies democracy from various perspectives including inclusion, technology's effect on democracy, which is, of course, very important right now, and authoritarian international relations. She's a leading scholar on human rights, and her book, Making Human Rights a Reality, was awarded the best book of 2015 by the International Studies Association. So here's Emily, and she'll tell you more about the initiative and the event tonight. <laughs> uh, good evening and welcome. Can you hear me all? I'm projecting it. Okay. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day and your evening to come and join us for this event, which is really our inaugural public event for this Future of Democracy initiative. We're extremely uh, excited to have you here, and it's great to see some uh, faces that I know and many faces that I don't. So welcome and thanks for taking the time to, to join us. I want to thank my dean, my dean, my dean, no, my dean uh, for her support and from the support from the uh, School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD for supporting this initiative, and also for Timing Chime, who's uh, the director of the UC Institute for Global Conflict and Cooperation, uh, and for his amazing staff. Marie is in the back there. I'm not sure Lindsay's here tonight, but for making this event uh, happen. So. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course to my partner in crime who's over there, Professor Christina uh, Schneider, um, for making this all happen and uh, making this a team. So together we've launched this initiative because we're very concerned about the state of democracy around the world. And the fact is that there are many democracies where uh, erosion is happening. And that includes in very well-established Western democracies like the one that we're living in today. Uh, but in a much broader uh, swath of, of the world, and it's a great concern for us, and I hope for the audience that's here as well. We have a growing number of countries that have sort of operated outside of the post-war democratic consensus that are rising in influence uh, in international affairs, uh, broadly speaking. We have a rising number of powerful authoritarian governments that are doing the same. And of course, uh, she mentioned technology briefly, that's a very important part of this initiative, which is we have the emergence of technologies that are helping aspiring autocrats, if you will, uh, and also um, just various forms of extremists rise to power. And so we're very concerned about these things. So our aim in this initiative is really to expand our understanding for how to strengthen democracy and for how to do it at all levels of governance. So that includes in our backyard, uh, and that includes abroad and in countries around the world. So our research is really focused on bringing scholars and practitioners together to try and figure out how to present practical solutions to some of the biggest challenges for democracy uh, today. And to do that while supporting what we call the next generation of thought leaders. So that's many of our students, but many of our faculty, but many people in the public and private sector that we're working together with. Uh, and with an eye to engaging with the public. So that's very much the spirit with why we're here uh, to share this with you tonight. So it's with this mission in mind that I'd like to welcome and thank our Executive Vice Chancellor, Dr. Elizabeth Simmons, uh, into this conversation. She wears many hats in her role, but in this capacity, she's the institution's second ranking officer dedicated to making our campus inclusive, 
student-oriented, research-focused, uh, and also with attention to detail on service. So we appreciate that you've taken the time. Thank you, Carolyn, for the introduction, and I would like to hand it over to you briefly. to be able to gather once again in person for intellectual events like this one. This is what the university is really supposed to be all about. And it's nice to be past worrying minute by minute about viruses and get back to thinking about big strategic issues together. Um, there, uh, as, uh, as my colleagues have alluded to, there have been um, many events in recent years that have shown us that democracies are under threat. And uh, while challenges to democracies are not new, the exact nature of the challenges is ever evolving. And I think it's really important that uh, tonight's speaker has written in other contexts about uh, the role that the, um, the rule of law plays in really multifaceted roles in supporting healthy democracies, both through um, systems building for the long term and also in the shorter term for helping you navigate crises that, that can come along. Um, UC San Diego tries to build the next generation of students, the students who are with us years, year to year, into not only individuals who understand one field well, but who can become change makers, who can help us think about the world as it needs to be tomorrow and help respond to whatever the challenges are going to be. And uh, I think that uh, the School of Global Policy and Strategy plays a particular role there, reminding us that um, it's not always just about the equations, it's not always just about the measurements, but about how those interact with human society and where that's gonna take us in the long run. And uh, in, that, uh, in that sense, I think that talks like tonight's and the, um, the initiatives that, uh, that uh, were spoken about, both the Institute for uh, Global, Global Conflict and Cooperation and the um, Future of Democracy Initiative, really help us focus and focus in very particular ways that even I, as a theoretical physicist, can appreciate Again, it's not all about the equations. We really have to go beyond that. So coming back to tonight, um, I want to thank you all in advance for participating in the discussions that we're going to have in a very um, you know, collegial and respectful manner, even though we may not all agree on all of the details. I know you're here because you want to engage, on, you want to engage in ideas. And, um, I think that uh, discussions like the ones that we're going to have tonight are important because they help us understand the imperative for transparency in our society. They remind us of the importance of accountability, which also demands that we be able to really talk together honestly about the facts. And these kinds of um, discussions inform our efforts to really bolster civic engagement and identify opportunities for change. So, no small, uh, no, no small uh, job that we've put, you, put before you. Um, and we're just delighted to have the uh, Honorable M. Margaret McEwen to talk with us tonight and really lead us into some new ideas. So back to you, Professor <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll uh, move on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Without further ado, uh, many, many introductions, I want to introduce the most important uh, person who's here tonight, which is, of course, uh, Margaret McEwen, uh, for our first inaugural lecture. And we're so grateful to have you here. Can you hear me? Okay, just check it. All right. I'll try and adjust. There we go. Better. Better. Okay, great. So uh, she has served for almost 25 years, is that right? Uh, something along those lines. Um, as judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit uh, in the great state of California. And she too uh, has many hats that she wears, and I'm gonna try and share about a few because if I were to tell you them all, it would take up the entire time of the lecture. So here are a few things to note about this extraordinary uh, person. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and an affiliated scholar at the Center for the American Center of the West at Stanford University. 
Uh, she's also a Juris in Residence at the University of San Diego School of Law. She's a former White House fellow, and I believe she was the first female partner uh, in her firm at Perkins Coy. She chairs the Ninth Circuit Workplace Environment Committee. She's on the Council of the American Law Institute, the Judicial Advisory Board of the American Society of International Law, and the Editorial Board of Litigation Magazine. And as if that was not enough, there's much more. She's on the board of the World Justice Project and is vice chair of the ABA Rule of Law Initiative uh, and current special advisor. She's been a visiting professor at many different prestigious universities, uh, in, in, which is extraordinary. Uh, and she has given many lectures throughout the world on issues of constitutional law, ethics, uh, human rights, uh, and so on and so forth. And I would be remiss before uh, turning the mic over to her if I didn't uh, note that she's just published uh, a new uh, book that is on citizen justice, the environmental legacy of William O. Douglas. So we're extraordinarily honored that she has taken time to be here with us today to talk about the future of democracy. She'll speak for approximately 30 minutes or at her leisure, and then we'll be very hope, uh, happy to open it up to Q&A afterwards. Please join me in warmly welcoming the Honorable Margaret Mitchell. Well, I'm really honored to be here tonight to help launch this really important mm -hmm. initiative. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care about the future of democracy. I think that um, the last... I've worked in the international rule of law field for more than two decades, so I've seen it up close. And in doing that, I've also seen the backlash against democracies. So this launch couldn't be more timely. Yesterday, I had the privilege down at the Shell to swear in almost 700 new Americans to become citizens of the United States. My message, treasure and protect our democracy. So I'm really appreciative of this invitation from Emily and Christina and what they intend to do here, um, I just am a little teaser, if you will, to make you think about these issues. Now, the headlines warning about this demise of democracy, you see them every day. And this coming crisis is a constant drumbeat in the news media. The challenge, I think, is trying to sort through all the histrionics and really make sense of what is it that's happening. So I plan to talk with you tonight about the rule of law on a global scale and how it intersects with democracy. Of course, I have no crystal ball or predictions on where we're going, and I'm gonna leave that to these wonderful scholars here at the University of California and specifically here at UCSD. Now we often throw around this concept, the rule of law. It's a very lofty concept. And you hear it in speeches, you hear it elsewhere. But do we stop to think about, well, what are we talking about? And I wanna suggest to you, it's not just this catchy, feel-good phrase that we can throw around. The question is, do we have the reality of a transparent, accessible, and fair justice system? because I think the rule of law reflects the values of who we are, or at least who we'd like to be. A democracy, we'd like to have tolerance, we'd like to have fairness, and of course we want freedom. Now, it probably won't surprise you that there's no uniform <coughs> definition of rule of law, but I want to say it's not simply in the eye of the beholder. It was first popularized in the 19th century by a scholar named A.V. Dicey. And he argued that there were really three parts, or as he called, kindred concepts. What is the rule of law? He said it's a government that's limited by law, it's equality under law, and it's protection of human and civil rights. So I wanna make one important distinction before we begin our journey. Rule of law does not mean rule by law. Simply having a legal system and a set of laws on the books does not give you the rule of law. And maybe the best contemporary example I can think of, Russia. They have a beautiful constitution, 
They have more laws than you can imagine. But they lack a culture of law. And importantly, nobody has a monopoly on saying that they are in favor of the rule of law. Um, I found that Xi Jinping actually has published a manifesto, and here's the title. Xi Jinping Thoughts on Rule of Law. So I'll leave you to read that in your spare time. <laughs> what is the rule of law? Well, I use a definition from the World Justice Project, and I think it captures this concept through a couple of universal principles. You need accountability. You need just laws, so you don't need just laws. <laughs> you need an open government, and you need accessible and impartial justice. And to think about what that means, I want to take you back in time and this timeline of where we've come in the rule of law. OK, following World War II, incredible euphoria. And it seemed that as democracies expanded across the globe, that there was going to be no limit to democracies. We all remember back the Nuremberg trials. And we think back, and that's really seen on an international scale, not only the beginning of international law, but a vindication of human rights. And of course, that optimism was shattered not long after when we found ourselves in the Cold War, which we then had this geopolitical tension and fighting between our two superpowers, the United States and Russia. That lasted 44 years. That is a long time. But then we had another euphoric event, and that was the fall of the Berlin Wall. So there we are, the 1990, it's actually 1989, it's aftermath. We had peaceful revolutions that overthrew most of the Eastern Bloc. So then again, we have this giddiness and euphoria. But the reality is that the decommunization did not inexorably lead to democracy. Now, there were failed states like Afghanistan. And there were, of course, a number of blossoming and emerging democracies. So now here we are in the 21st century. And we now have new China faces and new challenges, the rise of China, which was not an issue when we were talking about the Cold War. So what then is the state of law? I would love to deliver you a report card that would make any parent happy, but I can't do that because it wouldn't be true. In a recent book on international law, uh, one of my uh, colleagues and professors, Professor Paul Stefan at the University of Virginia wrote the following. He said the 21st century is the place where the hopes of the 1990s came to die. That's a pretty bleak picture of what we're looking at. But regrettably, the truth is that we are in the midst of a global rule of law recession, characterized by closing space for civil society, closing space for the media and free speech, incredibly declining trust in our institutions, and of course, we have the increased prevalence of authoritarian governance, even in established democracies. So to illustrate this reality, I turn to the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. Now in fairness and candor, I am on the board of the World Justice Project. And we have had since 2009 an index on rule of law. It's not the be all and end all, but I offer it up because I think it gives you a benchmark of what's happening. And what we've done is we have a group of scholars. They not only do on the ground interviews, but they're doing work in the field and consultation, statistics, and everything else. They're looking at everything from what are the constraints on government? What's happening in corruption? That actually is a global problem and one of the worst things that we're seeing in terms of the collapse of the rule of law. What do we have on fundamental rights? What do we have on regulatory enforcement? What's happening on order and security? So take a look at this map 
And what you're seeing here is just a snapshot of global adherence to the rule of law. Green is good, red and orange and yellow is not so good. What we've seen in the last five years, seven years, is 65% of the countries showed a decline in rule of law adherence. 4.4 billion people live in countries where rule of law is declining. So the reality is the vast majority of countries and population live at the low end of adherence. Let me show you just another snapshot. And this one is showing just this last year, 61% of the countries showed a decline. And if you look at where all those red countries are, they won't be necessarily a surprise to you. But I want to show you the rankings that uh, we have found. Here's the rankings, and they too won't surprise you. Maybe you would have imagined, where's the United States? It's not in the top 10. How could that be? The reason for that is that we have issues related to criminal justice, access to civil justice, and perceived discrimination in a number of areas. So it brings us down, not far, we're number 26, and we have a 0.71 ranking. So I wanna look ahead. What are the challenges in rule of law? We don't have enough time tonight to name all of those. It's bottomless. Migration, discrimination, climate change, nuclear war, poverty, plagues, famine, pandemics, and more. So I wanna focus on two specific challenges in the rule of law. One is the heavy hand, and I would say actually heavy fists, of the executive and the legislature on the judicial <coughs> branch. And the second is the double edged reality of the internet. So let's talk about this heavy hand of the executive and the legislature. You know, in recent years, there's this popular soundbite, and it goes like this. The rise of authoritarian governments has led to this fissure in the rule of law. For as democratic regimes uphold the rule of law. Very convenient dichotomy. But I think it's a mistake to basically rest the argument on this dichotomy of authoritarianism versus democracy. And the obvious reason is that we have seen both democratic and authoritarian regimes invade the separation of powers. And along with legislatures, place a very heavy hand or fist on judicial power. Now, when we talk about popular understanding, popularity, the judiciary, for good reason, has really long played a central role as a check on executive power. We've generally upheld human rights. We've provided oversight against this scourge of corruption. And the judiciary serves as a beacon, I think, and a buffer against arbitrary and capricious action by both the executive and the legislature. Elena Kagan, one of our justices on the Supreme Court, highlighted this, and she said that when you think about judicial legitimacy, it comes from the fact that the institution balances the political branches. But I want you to go back in history and remember one of our founders, Alexander Hamilton. And he's famous for saying that the judiciary does not have either the power of the sword or of the purse. Very true. And all we have is judgment. So I suggest to you that that power that we do have, judgment, is at risk today. So I want to offer some concrete examples of this. Let me first talk about Tunisia. Remember again, we're talking euphoria, like we had after World War II, euphoria of the Arab Spring. Everything's looking fantastic. Well, Tunisia seemed to be one of those democracies. We're now 10 years later, and the Brookings Institution has said, no, it's a work in progress. Tunisia is not 
a democracy. Now, during these 10 years, I had the great fortune to travel there and work with the judiciary, with the Supreme Court, with trial judges, with judges all over the country. What were we doing? We were talking with them on how do you actually make a constitution work? How can you give independent judgments even when somebody's you know, putting the thumb on the scale and fighting back? And how do we give credence to their rulings and make sure that the public is following the rulings? Well, it was really remarkable what I saw, and the spirits and aspirations were incredibly high. Today, those hopes have been totally dashed. Recently, we have a democratically <coughs> elected president, Saeed, and he announced his intention to dissolve the High Judicial Council. So you see pictures there of judges. There they have beautiful robes with these red things, kind of like a la England and France. They are protesting against the government because the executive said that they were gonna actually dissolve this Judicial Council. And in fact, the Supreme Court building shut down so judges couldn't even fulfill their constitutional duties. But then he did what we're all afraid of. He dismissed 57 judges. So here's Tunisia, once thought to be this lone success in the Arab Spring, and it now suffers really incredibly from the heavy hand of the executive. Hong Kong. Undoubtedly you've been reading about Hong Kong. So at a time when we have all these democracy advocates flexing their muscle in Hong Kong. Here's what we have going on in Beijing. The Standing Committee on China's National People's Congress has a new interpretation of the Hong Kong national security law. So what does it do? Well, it basically hands to Hong Kong's chief executive the power to overturn court decisions. So I don't know how anyone could stand up with a straight face and say, but we have an independent judiciary. That same decree has banned foreign lawyers. And it also permits the executive to determine who will be the judges for some of these high profile trials. There is an online publication in Hong Kong, it's called Diplomat, and it claimed that 2022 was the year Hong Kong's rule of law died. So you're starting to see, well, there is a similarity around the world in the rhetoric and in the reality. Foreign lawyers were some of those who actually stepped forward to represent some of the democracy advocates. So what happened to them? Well, they were basically threatened. They had GPS tracking devices. Um, they were receiving Chinese funeral money at their offices, and of course they had anonymous threats. And at the same time, you saw large numbers of lawyers fleeing from Hong Kong, going to jurisdictions where they could practice, such as Singapore or in England. What we now have is a group of lawyers fleeing, but we have 47 pro-democracy figures who were on trial, and that trial is continuing as we talk here tonight. You want to know, well, what, what crime did they commit? Here's the crime. The crime was conspiracy to commit subversion under the national security law. So what did they do? What's the crime? Well, the crime was actually participating in an unofficial primary election. Something you would think actually would be a basic democratic right. Now, true to form, the government said well, Hong Kong prides itself on its rule of law. So now we have this ongoing criminal trial. It's the largest national security proceeding that's happened in Hong Kong since the government protests 2019. So to my mind, this sadly illustrates the difference between rule of law and rule by law. Let me then turn to Poland, which is at the bottom here. It views itself as a democracy, although a number of academics and others, including Freedom House, say that it no longer qualifies as a full democracy. 
So under the guise of trying to address corruption, there's new government laws. And they basically brought the judiciary under political control. There's a constitutional tribunal, which is equivalent to our US Supreme Court. And it's basically been captured by executive appointees and they completely hew to the party line. Now, the other thing that's incredibly alarming you see here, even if you can't read Polish, and that is they created this Supreme Court disciplinary chamber. And that chamber makes it possible for the judges to face disciplinary action if they make rulings the government doesn't agree with. So they have been dismissing judges left and right, and you see here judges actually protesting because their colleagues are under this thumb because if they make a ruling the government doesn't like, they then can be disciplined. The EU actually um, struck down a number of these laws and significantly they withheld almost $35 billion in funding. That's pretty significant. So there's now this ongoing tug of war, Poland saying, we're revising things. Uh, we're having some modifications. We're having reforms. And the EU over here saying, here's my $35 billion of funding. Neighboring Turkey is really not much better. I want to also talk with you about a situation here in our own hemisphere, and that's Guatemala. Now, Guatemala has shifted to what we thought was an evolving democracy into what's really a kleptocracy. What does that mean? The justice system is at the service, not of the judges or independent judges, but criminal alliances among corrupt politicians, drug traffickers, organized crime, and powerful economic groups. The president has actually jailed anti-corruption judges and prosecutors. There is a court called the Court for High Risk Crimes, and that hears the most sensitive criminal and corruption cases. Those judges have been physically threatened, and the government also says, we're gonna take away your judicial immunity. So if you rule on one of these cases and we don't like it, you don't have immunity. But to me, the really sad thing, since 2021, at least 28 judges and prosecutors and lawyers and counting have fled and gone into exile. And there's just a small snapshot of these individuals. And you see, they come from the very highest levels of the court in Guatemala. So there's not only a brain drain, but the judges who are left are still subject to these incredibly draconian rules and that fist of the executive. Now, I wanna talk with you about Venezuela. When Hugo Chavez was the president, I was working with the ABA Rule of Law Initiative. And we had a number of programs in Venezuela. And I was headed down there, and the day before I left, the president called Hugo Chavez the crackpot from Caracas, which, you know, that was hardly an auspicious beginning to my trip. Um, but I tried to make the best of it, and I got down there, and they said, we'd like you to be on a call-in radio show in Spanish, so I said, okay. Maybe I'll get some softball questions. Yeah. Question number one. How can you tout the rule of law after the Supreme Court's ruling in Bush v. Gore? Oh, how was I gonna answer that? I certainly, that wasn't something I prepared for or exactly thought about, but you know, here's what I said. I said that whether you agree or disagree with the Supreme Court on Bush v. Gore, the certification of the election went forward. And the American public got back to work and we went back to school. There was no violence, there was no protesting, and there was no interruption of our democratic government. That was the essence 
of the rule of law. Well, after the events of January 6th, I could not give that same answer today. And I think this example highlights that the United States is not immune from challenges to our rule of law. So when, as in the United States, the executive attacks on our judiciary are political and personal, when those attacks actually undermine our institutions and the legitimacy of the judiciary, and when they threaten our impartiality because of these threats, then I would say, yes, judicial independence is at risk. When the judiciary is under siege, it strikes at the core of our democracy, and the people are under siege. Now, since my time in Venezuela, it's no surprise the UN says, of course, there's serious human rights violations, there's a judiciary lacking in independence. Venezuela is number 140 out of 140 countries on the world justice index. Now, before I leave this kind of topic of what the executive and the legislature are doing around the world, I have to at least talk very briefly about Israel. That was not on my original thought or list as when Emily and Christina called me in, in the fall, because it was only last month that the justice minister said, we're gonna reform the judiciary. And how are they gonna do that? Well, they're going to allow the legislature to override the Supreme Court's decisions. Did we just hear that out of China and Hong Kong? This is out of Israel, often really touted as a major democracy. And then they're gonna reconfigure how the justices are chosen. So not surprisingly, critics say this is an incredible blow to Israeli democracy and judicial independence. As you know, there are now protests underway. The situation is very fluid, it's dynamic. These are proposals, they haven't been adopted. So stand by and watch those and see if it's yet another example played out in practice of what's happening to the judiciary. So I wanna to turn to my second focus and that is the internet. I love the internet but I wanna talk about the dark side of the internet. And really, it's a double-edged sword. <clears throat> so think back to the mid-1990s, kind of the humble beginnings. There were only 16 million people who were internet users, most of them in the United States. Now we have more than 4.5 billion people with access to the internet, and 3.5 billion of them are on social media. So like many new technologies, of course, um, the internet was seen as something phenomenal, as transformational, and it really has been, actually. All the early calls, it's a democratization tool. It's a means of community networking. It's a political movement in and of itself. And on a global scale, it's a foundation for citizens to join the global democracy agenda. That was great, not just hype, but hope, I would say, for the internet. So the Washington Post boldly complained, the web is far and beyond history's previous information technologies. And it changes how we will interact with other human beings. There was also a slightly humorous take on the internet back in the early days. A corporate executive wrote that if you had electronic town meetings, and they started polling better ratings than Seinfeld or Roseanne or Beavis and Butthead, then of course everyone, including the companies, would need to watch out. So I'm not here today to debate, of course, or even celebrate all the amazing things that are brought about by the internet. But rather, here we are two decades later, and I wanna sound a note of caution when it comes to the internet and the implications for the rule of law. So the very properties that made this this amazing global phenomenon 
carry with them also the same downsides if they're put in the hands of repressive and authoritarian regimes. You know, governments have become very adept, just as much as the activists, and harnessing the power of the internet. And as this University of Chicago study says, it's not without its costs that were sometimes severe and disruptive. So what do we have? The dark side of the internet. There's another index that I think is important put out by Freedom House. And they do these global studies of internet freedom. 12th consecutive year, Nah, it's basically in a nose dive. And digital repression follows other repression and crackdown on human rights. So it could be military action, you know, think of Russia, Sudan, Myanmar, or it could be in the situation of declining democracies like Poland or Hungary. So the measurements that they're looking at in thinking, well, what, what is freedom on the internet? Well, it's really the flip side. What are governments doing to strip what used to be open freedom on the internet? And there's quite a few things they've done. Internet shutdowns, and that occurred during the pandemic and before. Blocking on foreign websites, uh, social media, and everything else. And of course, putting all kinds of technological controls on the internet that basically stifle the public's ability to use the internet. Here's a chart from Freedom House. And you know, if you add this up, 71% of the world's countries are either not free or only partly free. That, of course, as you know, it kind of mirrors that overall rule of law index that we're talking about. And here's the ranking charts, which we've drawn from the internet freedom studies. Okay, who's at the bottom? China's been tagged as the most repressive online environment. How do they do this? Well, censoring access, targeting journalists, activists, religious groups, minorities, non-governmental organizations. And then also very harsh regulation of technology companies. We, of course, have the top 10, Iceland, Estonia, which bills itself as Estonia, one of the very early entrants into the internet world. But you know how we're always saying, just go Google it. Well, you can't just Google it in China. And the reason is because they blocked a large number of internet sites, um, and here's just a sampling of those. They also have a number of sites which they call the China Firewall Test. You can type in a religion, a church, a synagogue, or different things, um, Dunkin' Donuts, and you can see, are they blocked or are they not blocked? And this is just a sampling of the thousands of blocked sites. Russia's no different. They have blocked Facebook and Twitter. And they've also banned new uploads to TikTok. Now, why have they done that? Well, they claim it's because it's in retaliation of the platforms, like Facebook, Google, Twitter, et cetera, restricting Russian propaganda. So obviously, the war has really exacerbated the situation in Russia. <coughs> Consider, there was a university student who has recently been arrested for putting anti-war protests or posts on her social media. She's 20 years old. She's charged with justifying terrorism and discrediting the Russian military. She is now under house arrest and basically has an electronic monitor. She's an example of someone who may be under house arrest but who's not yet been arrested and actually imprisoned. So one of the things I want to talk about is what I say is a troubling phenomenon, and it's really called the balkanization of the internet. When the internet began, 
all of the hype was, we have a global internet. The internet knows no boundaries. The internet knows no borders. Well, we do know that the internet has borders because those servers are in a country, whether it's Ireland or the United States or somewhere else. And so every country has their own regulatory regime. The question is, what do you do with it? So at the outset, there was hope that we would have kind of a global sense of the internet. But balkanization means country by country by country that they are throttling and really putting the thumb on the internet. So when there's challenges like hate speech or privacy, now there's increased fracturing along these national borders. That's the rise of what we call cyber sovereignty. We talked about the government shutdowns. These blackouts, sometimes they're quick, sometimes they last weeks, months, and even years. And when do they happen? Well, you could guess when they might happen to quell mass protests, shut down the internet to forestall election laws, shut down the internet, to shut down any kind of um, thing that the military is doing <coughs> that they don't want the public to know. Or in some cases, we have conflict areas which are completely cut off from the outside world. So they have no idea what is happening given this. I mean, one example was Cuba um, just two years ago. There were a number of protests in Cuba. So what did the government do? They passed a new law on internet access and they limit the use of social media to organize protests. What does all this mean for the rule of law? Nothing good, I can tell you that. Um, many countries have free speech clauses in their constitutions. Those are those beautiful constitutions. But, the crackdown on free expression on the internet is really antithetical to those rights. So the reality is there's significant limits on speech on the internet. Um, it could be information from foreigners. Any kind of foreign influence is generally seen in a repressive government as being antithetical to the government's values and views. Um, there's also more government surveillance, and you couple that with um, your loss of ability to control your private data. So now <coughs> leaders are actually imprisoning human rights activists and others who are on the internet. So we have decreased transparency and decreased accountability, but you would have imagined if we were in the mid-1990s or early 2000s that we would have had more transparency and more accountability, and we did for a while, but now that space is closing. I think one of the most troubling developments with respect to the internet is the criminalization of speech on the internet. Now, on this point, I don't feel like I'm crying wolf. There are specific laws that target internet speech such as the ability to speak out against the government or for spreading misinformation, whatever that is, often in the eye of the beholder. And they land you a long prison sentence. Look at this. In China, there's this 18-year prison sentence when someone criticized the coronavirus handling. You've got the situation in Saudi Arabia, 34-year prison sentence. Or in Egypt, where there was a TikTok influencer, 10 year sentence, worse executions in Iran. So the examples go on and on and on, but they should convince you of the seriousness of this criminalization. So it's one thing to monitor, it's another to surveil, it's another to have throttling or slowing down of the internet. But when you are taking people and putting them in jail, that's something we should stand up and talk about. Now, COVID. We've had about 6.7 million deaths in COVID. And so it's actually accelerated this decline in the rule of law. 
Why? Well, not just in some countries, but really the democracy worldwide. Governments assert emergency powers, government control. They restrict rights of assembly even on the internet. Courts have been closed. Justice has been delayed in some places completely denied. And the government action and reaction to the pandemic has been to limit access to information and to justify more surveillance. So again, governments have gone in and used the pandemic as an excuse to basically crack down on what's happening. So I have brought you a little bad news tonight. And for that, I, I don't think I can apologize because I don't think it's my fault. But I think you might wonder, as I have my colleagues and my family, like, why would I spend my free time taking quick turnaround places, trips to Vietnam or Colombia or Tanzania, corresponding endlessly with judges overseas, banging the door for judicial independence? It's because I believe that if we plant these seeds, no matter how small, that rule of law in the end will pay off and it will prevail. And in that, I'll offer you one personal example. I'm a very good friend who was a Turkish tax judge. We met over many years at international judicial conferences. I visited him and his family in Turkey. So here he is. The tweet I got from him in 2016 He's basically saying that arrest warrants were out for 2,700 plus judges, prosecutors, including him. No more independent judiciary in Turkey. And just to drive it home, the Turkish government said, yep, that's what we did. 4,000 judges were sacked. He went to jail for six years. His wife couldn't get a job. His brothers and sisters couldn't get a job. There was not one ounce of economic support for that family other than the wife's parents. Then he was released in 2022. And he was like everybody else. He couldn't get a job because he was branded as a terrorist. And his crime? Speaking out for judicial independence. He says here in that particular email, well, spouses were banned from employment and you couldn't really get a job. You're working in badly paid jobs like pedaling in the streets, motoring, which is kind of the equivalent to driving an Uber or checking in a grocery store. So imagine my incredible euphoria just one week ago when I got an email from him and he said, my family and I have landed in Switzerland. <laughs> and there he was at the airport with not many suitcases, but he's there with his wife and his three girls. He's now in a refugee camp in Switzerland. But what I like is his hope because what he wrote last to me was basically the following. I hope I'll soon be ready to focus again on my pen and our struggle for justice and judicial <coughs> independence. And how beautiful is that? Because that was his crime in the first place, solely his pen. And so that's what gives me hope. Now in conclusion, I wanna say, I don't have any panacea for getting the rule of law back on track in every respect. So it's no surprise I'm going to leave that challenge to these intellectuals and scholars here at the university. I have a day job, and that is I'm a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. But I think this center is so exciting in terms of what it can be and what it can do, and also thinking about where we go 
from here. I do have several observations I'll leave you with. First, I don't think the rule of law can be delinked from the economy or the private sector. It's not the exclusive province of governments or nonprofit, non-governmental organizations. Collaboration is required. Second, in the internet arena, there are really complicated trade-offs in politics, policies, and free speech. <clears throat> so we can't like have a hand-waving solution. Tech companies and their critics need to sit down and work together. Of course we have poor hate speech. Of course we don't like misinformation. But generally, we've had policies to try to control this, and the reality is some of those policies are gonna backfire on us. Why? Because our approach will have a ripple effect around the world. And what we thought was good policy, such as clamping down on certain kinds of speech, why that's just a recipe for some of the lesser democracies or the authoritarian governments to say, the US can do it, we can do it too. And finally I'll say, in my view, the judiciary still remains as a bulwark against arbitrary and capricious conduct by the executive and the legislative branches. And strengthening our judges' personal resolve against corruption and in support of fair decision making is critical making sure that judges and judicial networks continue to be cheerleaders, mentors, and sounding boards around the world really serves that purpose. There is no substitute for personal judicial diplomacy. Now I have a little note on my computer and it says, just say no. And why do I have that note? Because I am an incorrigible volunteer. And so I need to have that note. However, when Emily and Christina call, how could I say no when the subject is democracy and the rule of law? So join me in never saying no to justice. And hats off to this amazing new center. Thank you. when it can have this deleterious effect on democracy, and it does. But then I have to say, well, what is misinformation? Well, there are things that I think fall on the side of truth and lies. There's no doubt about that. And that's one of the things in the justice system that we're always wrestling with, you know? In the old days, people would hold up a photograph and they'd say, is this a photograph of what you saw at the scene of the crime? Yes, it is. Well, then all of a sudden you could doctor photographs, or you could create them through AI, or you could create narratives through chat GPT, whatever. So it is, you know, people are not getting the kind of information that would help them make rational judgments. But the question is, if you really believe in free speech, is it the role of the government to clamp down on misinformation, and that is, I think, the really tough policy question. We have an incredibly vibrant free speech history in the United States from people, you know, politicians, and I speak of no one in the current world, but for years, politicians have lied 
And so there was nothing new. When you go back to the late 1700s and the 1800s and they accused people of this and they accused people of that, they've been lying for years. <laughs> so then there were laws that said, well, you can't lie or say bad things in the wake of an election. Those were struck down as unconstitutional. So I think figuring out how you could either regulate, moderate, or inform the public is what you're left with. And there is no easy answer. I, I'm wondering if you could address the carceral state of our democracy, because we are the nation with the highest per capita rate of people currently serving in prisons and jails. And here in San Diego, we have the most deaths in our jails of any other jail in the country. And so I'm wondering if you could address what that means for a democracy when we have such a high percentage of people, primarily people of color, that, and how justice is really failing them and what that means for our democracy. Well, this question of the level of incarceration in the United States is exactly one of the reasons that we don't score as high in these rule of law indices compared to other countries because the level is so high. How has that come about? Well, we, we see kind of a rolling situation here where we keep passing more and more laws. We're not criminalizing speech, but we're criminalizing a lot of other things. And the more you criminalize, the more you're gonna have people that are found guilty or uh, are incarcerated. However, Simply because you have laws that are criminal laws doesn't mean that everybody has to go to jail or that they have to stay there for so long. So in the federal system, we have a number of crimes where there's a mandatory minimum. The judge can't really go below that, extraordinary circumstances. So those crimes really put people in prison for long periods of time. That to me is really a compact that needs to be made between Congress or state legislatures and the people in terms of what do we want. But surprisingly, when you go out and you ask people, it depends on what the crime rate is. During the pandemic, in fact, violent crime actually fell. But if you talk to most people, they say, no, no, the pandemic caused crime to rise. And so that was this visceral sense. Sure, there were some property crimes, but not the same violent crime. So if we are going to get on par with some of the other countries, um, and mostly those, many of those are in um, Scandinavian states, then we do have to do exactly what you're talking about, is get a handle on, are we putting too many people in jail? It's costly. Are there alternatives? For years, courts have worked with diversion programs and various alternatives, and those are definitely what is going on in the United States. But there's no uniformity, and it really varies state by state. And the sad fact is, when you look at race, then even though we have a high incarceration rate, we have an even higher rate of those from racial minorities. We have time for one last question. Yes, um, I, I think that was a great question, and I think that you might also want to talk about the privatization of jails and prison and the fact that there's a lot of money being made to incarcerate people. Um, but my question is different, and I wanted to ask you about the U.S., uh, and especially with your notable um, influence here in the United States. Um, the U.S. Uh, participation in the International Criminal Court mm -hmm. and, uh, and the fact that the U.S. doesn't fully participate and that the U.S. has a very sketchy um, mandate. Sometimes they uphold the ICC and sometimes they don't just depending on whether it is in the U.S. interest or not. And the rest of the world sees this very clearly. Um, 
what you think of that and, and in your numerous positions, what are you able to do to try to reverse that? Well, let me first say I'm in no position to reverse that <laughs> because I do believe in the separation of powers. I don't have the power of Congress. I don't have the power of the executive. But you have stated it so clearly that we have the International Criminal Court in The Hague. We have primarily that court has brought to justice um, individuals from Africa, which has been a criticism of the court. We've also had other special tribunals, such as the Tribunal for Rwanda, or um, for um, Bosnia, a recent one on Cambodia has just uh, phased out of existence. And this has been really, um, I think, a huge tension between the United States and other countries in the human rights arena. We have, uh, for example, I've had for many years, an ambassador for war crimes. Um, and our ambassador for war crimes had to kind of go out on a dual track, and that is uh, campaign against war crimes, at the same time jumping back to say, but our president doesn't support us being, uh, nor Congress, a member of the international criminal court. So I think we've lost a lot of face there, but um, I've seen it. Um, I have colleagues on the international courts, um, but I do know that even though the United States is not a member, that the United States is out and about in a lot of these arenas. And a good example of that is our former ambassador for war crimes and some of the current State Department people have been in Ukraine. They were also immediately over in Turkey and then going into Syria because when you have a crisis like the earthquake, you also have often a, a tamping down of human rights and um, other uh, humanitarian rights. So I think the United States walks down a careful path in this arena, but it's not really my role as the, uh, a judge in a domestic court, a domestic federal court, to be able to either advocate or to do anything about that. Now that doesn't mean that through my work on the rule of law, whether it's with Lawyers Without Borders or the American Bar Initiative or embassies, that I can't work in those arenas. But it does mean that that's a, that's a classic policy issue, which is not one that the US judiciary has the authority to determine. I'm so pleased that there are so many hands up and interest. I'm afraid we are out of time at this moment. One um, question more. You can take one question more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, let's take a last, uh, I, who's got the microphone? And then we are going to be, um, Emily, Christina, and I are going to be outside after. I was glad I'd like to hear your views on free speech, and it struck me there's a certain hypocrisy between the natural and right um, uh, attacks on books in libraries, and primarily in the South or Indiana, but at the same time, um, major, uh, a major publisher was almost stopped by seven or 800 of their employees in New York from writing a book about a Supreme Court justice because she Suppose a book, at, it's mostly a legal book, right? Um, but with a very high advance. Um, and, uh, but her views on abortion caused uh, almost a thousand publishing young people to protest. I mean, have, have things gone strangely the other way in America? And are groups like Penn and ACLU not supporting a kind of across the board, um, uh, you know, uh, freedom of speech that we, we used to have? 60s and 70s. You know, speech is a really interesting thing, and I've looked carefully at hate speech, for example, and compared us with the European jurisdictions where they have very strict rules on hate speech. And for example, you can't even sell or put on the internet Nazi memorabilia because they, of course, have this history in Europe. And in the United States, you can 
sell it, you can talk about it, whatever. I don't know that there's a retrenchment, and these things do, as you say, they kind of go in waves, but I don't think many of the primary free speech advocates have stepped back. But you know, it's like everything. It's when your ox is gored, sometimes, you all of a sudden have an epiphany that maybe there's some other policy that should come into play. And we see that a lot. So I don't think that the United States is going to back down from free speech. There's an important case to watch uh, this term in the Supreme Court. It's um, what's called Section 230, which would make you fall asleep if I knew <laughs> Section 230. But it's about the Communications and Decency Act. And it's about whether internet service providers should be held liable for certain things that are on their sites. Now, that was a law passed long ago, and the internet was um, more in its infancy during that time. But I think it'll be real interesting to see where does the Supreme Court go. So there's lots to be mined here. Um, there's no doubt about it. And you know, I really appreciate you all coming because it really shows that we care. And the, that is really um, as Pollyannish as it might sound. That's the first step in trying to understand and the fact that we can talk about it. So I really, really thank you and I thank the university as well.